Hi there, my name is Roger Pillema and I'm an orthopaedic surgeon with a particular interest in impairment assessment. In this series of talks, I would like to discuss the examination of the hand. At the outset, it is important to distinguish between two different types of examination. The first type is a systematic examination, which needs to be carried out in every case. The second type is a specific examination where we are looking for particular conditions such as carpal tunnel syndrome, de Quervain's tenosynovitis, various instabilities, etc. It is helpful to deal with each of these as almost separate entities. Even more helpful, however, is the need to understand the anatomy and physiology of the tests that we are going to carry out, which then makes for an appreciation of why we are doing these tests in that particular fashion. For example, one of the tests we do to assess ulnar nerve intrinsic function is to test for the power of adduction of the fingers. This is done by getting the patient to place the hand flat on the desk and then asking them to try and hold a piece of paper between the fingers while the examiner tries to take the paper away. In ulnar nerve lesions, patients lose this power of adduction and are unable to grip the paper. Why is it important for the hand to be placed flat on the desk? Well, if you flex your fingers down into the palm of the hand, you will see that they come down in a parallel fashion. However, if you flex each individual finger, you get a different picture. The fingers all flex towards one specific point in the distal forearm, about five centimeters above the wrist, so that as the fingers flex towards a fixed point, they actually develop an adductor force. Try this out on yourself. Place the piece of paper with your hand flat on the table and try and take the paper away and then raise your metacarpal hairs one centimetre off the surface and you will note the significant increase in adductor power that is achieved. The only way to avoid this is to make sure that you have the hand flat on the desk. As you will see when we eventually get to the systematic examination, this does not take much time at all. However, as suggested previously, an understanding of the anatomy and physiology makes for a far more meaningful and enjoyable examination. Part one of this talk, I will therefore revise the anatomy and function of the structures making up the hand. In part two, I will suggest a routine method of carrying out a basic examination of the hand, where you will now have an insight into why we are doing each test. In part three, we will discuss specific conditions and injuries of the hand anatomy and function. The hand is an amazing structure and as Jack Last points out, it is a grasping mechanism combining great strength with finely controlled accuracy at the same time as serving as the chief tactile organ. This slide demonstrates the space taken up in the sensory and motor cortices of the brain of the various body parts and shows the relative importance of the hand, the lips and the tongue. The hand is so important that if one has an amputation of all the digits at the level of the MP joints, AMA5 rates this as 90% impairment of the whole of the upper extremity. The function of the rest of the upper limb is in the main simply to be able to place the hand where it needs to be to carry out its function. And please note that the thumb is regarded as being worth 40% of the hand, that is 36% of the upper extremity and 22% whole person impairment. So let's start off with the anatomy. The structures we need to consider are the bones and joints, the ligaments that stabilize the joints, the muscles and tendons that move them, the nerves that make everything work, and the blood supply of the hand. This is the skeleton of the hand, and the important landmarks to point out are the scaphoid and the lunate bones of the carpus, and the copper metacarpal joint of the thumb, which is a very special joint allowing rotational movements as well as flexion, extension, abduction and adduction and is also very commonly involved in arthritic change. This is the tip of the radial styloid and this is the base of the first metacarpal, both readily palpable and the space between them is known as the snuff box. Also please note that if you draw a line through the distal radio ulnar joint you will strike the lunate. I will come back to this later. This shows the important soft tissue structures that are so commonly injured, namely the scapholunate ligament and the triangular fibro cartilage of the distal radia on the joint. Here there is an incomplete tear of the scapholunate ligament, 
but when there is a complete tear, one gets a separation between the scaphoid and the lunate, as shown in the next slide. Here you see the wide separation between the two bones where there has been a complete tear of the scapholunate ligament. Note also how the plane of movement of the thumb is at right angles to the plane of the fingers and you can check your own nails to confirm this. There are a number of important landmarks which you can readily confirm on yourself. At the level of the wrist anteriorly there are two easily palpable bony prominences, the scaphoid at the base of the thena eminence and the pesi form on the medial side of the wrist. Another important landmark is the snuff box where in days gone by, gentlemen used to place their snuff prior to inhalation. This is on the radial side of the wrist, so that when you actively extend your thumb and place your index finger in the gap between the extensor pollicis longus and abductor pollicis longus, uh, your finger falls into a depression. The bony prominence proximal is the radial styloid and distally is the base of the first metacarpal. So keep the tip of your index finger in the gap, slide it proximally so that one half of the tip of the finger is against the radial styloid and the other half still in the gap. If you now deviate your hand to the ulnar side, you will readily palpate the now prominent gaphoid abutting your finger. Keep trying until you're assured of this. The lunate, so named because it is crescent moon shaped, and the scaphoid are readily palpable on the dorsum of the wrist. So it is possible to palpate the scaphoid and lunate bones on the dorsum of the wrist. These are felt just distal to the distal end of the radius where we have two palpable depressions. To find the first depression which relates to the dorsal aspect of the scaphoid, extend the line down between the second and third metacarpals until you reach the distal end of the radius and you'll feel the depression. With the tip of your index finger in the depression, flex your wrist and you'll feel the dorsal aspect of the scaphoid abutting your finger. To find the more medial depression, which relates to the dorsal aspect of the lunate, extend a line down between the fourth and fifth metacarpals until you reach the distal end of the radius and the adjacent distal end of the ulna. As noted in an earlier x-ray, this is in line with the lunate. Once again, put the tip of your index finger in the depression, flex the wrist and you'll feel the smooth, rounded lunar surface quite easily, particularly when you go into force flexion. Once again, these structures are best felt with the tip of your index finger. Keep testing until you're sure you can feel both bones, and so onto the muscles and tendons. It is important to distinguish between two groups of muscles that move the joints. These are the extrinsic muscles which are right outside the hand and insert into the hand, namely the flexors and extensors of the digits. The long flexor muscles provide the power of the grip. The other group are the intrinsic muscles which both arise and insert in the hand. These muscles and tendons provide for the finer, skilled movement of the fingers. So, the extrinsic muscles. Let's start off by examining the long flexors, uh, of which there are two to each finger and one to the thumb. That is, nine tendons that pass through the carpal tunnel with the median nerve as shown here. The deep muscle of the forearm is the flexor digitorum profundus, with each tendon attaching to the base of the distal phalanx, so that when the muscle contracts, it causes flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint, with the fingers flexing into the palm of the hand. As you will note, when we come to testing for these muscles, while the tendon to the index finger separates from the other tendons in the forearm, the medial three tendons to the middle, ring and little finger only separate in the palm, so that these tendons do not have independent function. Try and fully flex your ring finger into the palm using the profundus tendon and flexing the DIP joint without flexing the middle and little fingers. You will see what I mean, it can't be done. Lying on top of the deep flexors is the flexor digitorum superficialis and these tendons insert into the middle phalanx of each finger causing flexion of the PIP joint. These tendons all act independently. This diagram shows how the superficialis tendon splits before inserting into the middle phalanx and thereby allowing the deep flexor tendon to pass through the gap and insert into the base of the distal phalanx. So how can we differentiate between the action of flexor profundus and flexor superficialis? Testing firstly for the profundus tendon. 
By keeping the PIP joint in extension, you thereby prevent the superficialis from flexing this joint. And the only movement that occurs is at the DIP joint, and that is due to the action of flexor digitorum profundus. And this is carried out for each of the fingers. One tests for flexor pollicis longus in the same fashion. How do we then test for flexor digitorum superficialis? As noted, because the tendons of flexor digitorum profundus do not have independent function, if you hold three of the four fingers in extension, you eliminate the function of the profundus tendon as shown here, with all the flexion occurring at the PIP joint. You can see how floppy the DIP joint is, indicating that the flexion is being caused by superficialis alone. Once again, test for each finger individually. Remember that flexor digitorum profundus to the index finger often separates higher up in the forearm and it may be able to act independently. This can often be partially overcome by hyperextending the other digits. Testing for extensor muscle function. Did you ever play this game as a kid where you get somebody to flex the middle fingers and place them together while extending all the other digits? And then telling them if they can separate the fingers, that means yes, and if they can't, that means no. You then ask them three straightforward questions where the answer is yes, and point to the thumbs, and to the index fingers, and to the little fingers. And you then ask them a very embarrassing question and point to the ring finger, and you see they cannot separate the fingers. Did you ever wonder why this was the case? Well, within a few minutes, you'll know the answer if you do not know it already. This slide shows the extensor tendons of the fingers all of which are supplied by the radial nerve, as are the extensors of the wrist. Here you will see extensor pollicis longus, which extends the IP joint of the thumb, and secondly, extends the MP and carpal metacarpal joints of the thumb. And these are the tendons of extensor digitorum communis to the four fingers, and you will note that they are interconnected by vinculi in a variable manner. As with flexor digitorum profundus, the extensors to all the fingers function together, so it would seem that one cannot extend the fingers individually. However, there are two extra extensors, one to the index finger, namely extensor indices, and one to the little finger, extensor digiti minimi, that allows these digits to function independently. Both of these tendons lie on the ulnar side of the common extensor tendons to the index and little fingers. So the thumb, index and little fingers all have independent extensive function, but not the middle and ring fingers. So when you hold all the digits in flexion, you can independently extend the thumb, the index and the little finger, but not the middle or ring fingers. The only extension that occurs is caused by intrinsic function, hence the inability to separate either the ring or middle fingers in the childhood game. So we now have three extensive functions that we can test for, namely extension of the wrist, extension of the fingers and extension of the thumb. We will continue discussing intrinsic function in the second part of this talk. Hi there, we concluded the first part of this talk by discussing the extrinsic muscles of the hand. We now come to the intrinsic muscles. As mentioned, these are small muscles that arise and insert in the hand. They are the muscles that control and produce all the fine movements of the hand. From a practical point of view, it is helpful to consider the intrinsic muscles in three groups. Firstly, the thenar muscles which control the thumb. Secondly, the hypothenar muscles which control the little finger. And thirdly, the intermediate muscles which are the main abductors and adductors of the fingers, as well as producing flexion at the MP joints when the fingers are in extension and extension at the IP joints when the MP joints are flexed. We need to give this last function of the intrinsic muscles some thought, as was discussed in the fifth talk in the series on ulnar nerve lesions. When the MP joints are in flexion, the long extensors cannot function because the extensor belly is stretched. So the only way you can extend your fingers is by using your intrinsics. Similarly, when your fingers are in full extension, you cannot use your long flexors to flex the MP joints, and the only way you can do this again is by using your intrinsics. All the intrinsic muscles that move the thumb, with one very important exception, are supplied by the median nerve as shown here, namely flexor pollicis brevis 
abductor pollicis brevis and the deep muscle opponens pollicis. The only other intrinsics supplied by the median nerve are the lateral two lumbricals. You possibly remember the mnemonic from your anatomy days, one of the few that can be used in public, namely LOAF, the lateral two lumbricals, opponens pollicis, adductor pollicis brevis, and flexor pollicis brevis. The two median nerve supplied muscles that we test for are the abductor pollicis brevis and the opponens pollicis. All the rest of the intrinsics are supplied by the ulnar nerve. I did mention that there is one very important intrinsic muscle of the thumb not supplied by the median nerve but by the ulnar nerve and that is the adductor pollicis shown here with the superficial muscles removed. The muscle arises from two heads and inserts into the base of the thumb and which we will test for very specifically. By the way, it is worth noting that the index finger has seven muscles, four extrinsics and three intrinsics that control its movements. See if you can work them out. So how do we test for the three nerves that supply the hand, namely the radial, the median and the ulnar nerves? And recall that the radial nerve does not supply any intrinsic muscles. From a practical point of view, I'm going to suggest nine tests for motor function, three for the radial nerve, three for the median nerve, three for the ulnar nerve. So for the radial nerve, the three tests are, firstly, we test for power of wrist extension. With a radial nerve lesion, one will have absent or weak wrist extension. So get the patient to extend the wrist and try to overcome this. Secondly, we test for finger extension, and remember it must be done with the MP joints in extension, otherwise, as we know, when the MP joints are in flexion, the intrinsics can extend the fingers. So with the MP joints in extension, press on the dorsum of the proximal phalanges in an attempt to flex them. Thirdly, a good test for extension of the thumb is the anti-gravity test. Place the hand flat on the table and get the patient to lift the thumb towards the roof and this movement can be resisted. For the median nerve three tests, firstly test for opponens pollicis by getting the patient to pinch the tip of the thumb and the little finger together and try and overcome this. Secondly, test for abductor pollicis brevis. I get the patient to place the hand in supination and lift the thumb towards the roof and I do this against resistance. And always check for wasting of the thena eminence. Here's an interesting question. If one has a low median nerve lesion with loss of function of abductor pollicis brevis, why can't you simply abduct the thumb using abductor pollicis longus, which is supplied by the median nerve higher up? Think about this and I'll give you the answer shortly. For the ulnar nerve, again, three tests. Abduction of the fingers, as we've suggested. Get the patient to fully abduct the fingers and try and resist your attempt to overcome the abduction. I always test specifically for the abduction of the index finger as this gives you the opportunity to see and palpate the bulk of the first dorsal interosseous muscle. In severe ulnar nerve lesions, this muscle wastes dramatically as shown in the slide. And here you can see the wasting of the first dorsal interosseous with clawing of the ring and little fingers in a case of ulnar nerve lesion. Secondly, the adduction of the fingers as we described earlier in the first part of the talk and the importance of keeping the hand flat on the table. In testing for adduction of the fingers and also the thumb which we will describe shortly, I prefer to use a manila folder rather than a piece of paper which I find is too thin. And thirdly, testing for adduction of the thumb which as we know is supplied by the ulnar nerve. The function of this muscle is to approximate the pulp of the thumb to the index finger as in the key grip. This test uh, we do is to get the patient to hold firmly onto a piece of paper or cardboard with both hands while the examiner does likewise, then ask the patient to try and prevent the examiner taking the paper away. Where there is normal function of the ulnar nerve, the patient will be able to hold the paper firmly. However, in an ulnar nerve lesion where the function of the adductor pollicis is weak or absent, the patient will attempt to hold the paper using the long flex of the thumb with flexion at the IP joint of the thumb. This is known as a positive Froman sign. It is worth noting that in testing for adduction of the thumb as suggested, you will see that the IP joint of the thumb is held in slight flexion. 
test this on yourself. This is due to the action of flexopolysis longus, as if this did not happen, the IP joint of the thumb would simply go into hyperextension. So the long flexor stabilizes the IP joint, so giving maximal power to the adductor pollicis. So to revise, for the radial nerve, we've got extension of the wrist, extension of the fingers, and extension of the thumb. For the median nerve, we've got opposition, we've got abduction, test for the wasting, thinner muscles. For the ulnar nerve, we've got abduction of the fingers, we've got adduction of the fingers, and we've got the adductor testing for frame and sign. And now, testing for sensation. This slide shows the commonly accepted sensory innovation of the hand, although there is some variability. As noted, the ulnar nerve supplies the medial one and a half digits, both front and back. The median nerve supplies the rest of the front of the hand and also supplies the dorsum of the lateral three and a half digits to the level of the PIP joints. The rest of the dorsum of the hand is supplied by the radial nerve. Despite the variation in sensory supply, there are what are called autonomous zones, which are those areas very specifically supplied by a particular nerve. For the median nerve, it is the pulp of the index finger. For the ulnar nerve, it is the tip of the little finger. And for the radial nerve, it is the web space on the back of the hand between the thumb and the index finger. As with sensory testing in general, and as was discussed previously, this needs to be carried out slowly and deliberately. The patient needs to understand what you are doing, needs enough time to consider and respond, and the testing often needs to be repeated with cross-checking. My preference is to use a K wire with a bent end so that it doesn't roll away and the sharp end is not sharp enough to draw blood. Here's another question to think about. How can one test for sensation in the hand of a patient who is unconscious or a child who is too young to understand? And finally, testing for vascular function. The blood supply of the hand is via the radial and ulnar arteries. The radial pulse is readily palpable, the ulnar pulse less so, but can be felt just lateral to the tendon of flexor carpal naris. Keep trying until you are confident that you can feel it. Here you have the radial artery and the ulnar artery and you can see how the two arteries communicate freely by the superficial and deep palmar arches and this is readily demonstrated in the Allen test. So what we do, we occlude radial and ulnar arteries, get the patient to open and close a few times, okay, leave it open, you can see how the hand blanches, release the ulnar artery and you can see how the hand perfuse as well, then do the same again, open and close, and open and close and leave it open, see the blanching, open the radial artery and you can see how the perfusion occurs. In answer to the first question then, when one has a low median nerve lesion and has lost the power of abductor pollicis brevis, why can't one simply abduct the thumb using abductor pollicis longus, which is supplied higher up in the arm? The answer is that abductor pollicis longus does not really function as an abductor of the thumb and this is a misnomer. It acts more as a stabiliser of the base of the thumb and can assist in flexing and abducting the wrist but has minimal, if any, abductor function of the thumb. With regard to the second question of any ways to test for sensation in the hand in a patient who is unconscious or too young to understand, here are three suggestions. With nerve damage, one also loses the autonomic supply of the fingers and loses the power of sweating. As a result, the pulp of the affected digits or digit will feel dry compared to the unaffected normal fingers. Telling the difference requires patience and practice. Secondly, the violent test. For the same reason of the above, when there is normal sensation and sweating, when one runs a smooth plastic pen over the digit, one will feel a slight resistance because of the moisture. When the skin is dry, there is much less resistance. Try this out on yourself. Then place a little bit of tissue over the end of the finger and see the difference. Interestingly, this is particularly noticeable in the little ring and middle fingers, but less resistance in the index finger and the thumb. And thirdly, the prune test. If you have ever spent a lot of time in the water, you will notice how the skin of the pulps of the fingers
tends to wrinkle. This does not happen in the denovated digits. The mechanism is thought to be due to vasoconstriction and there is much discussion as to the evolutionary reason for this. Thank you for joining me for this third session on the examination of the hand. In this session, I would like to describe a systematic examination of the hand. Hopefully, you will have watched my first two presentations on the hand in which I have discussed the anatomy, the physiology of the various tests that we will be carrying out. In the next talk, I will describe a more specific examination of the hand where we are looking at conditions such as the Quervain's tenosynovitis, carpal tunnel syndrome, and various deformities, etc. I'm now going to go over a routine examination of the hand twice, the first time with a bit of commentary and some explanation, and the second time without the commentary. Uh, I will carry out the examination across the narrow table, and all I need for the examination is a manila folder and a K-wire bent at one end. Uh, I will have taken a history of the patient, noting particularly any history of trauma. So let's begin. This is Chris, and thank you Chris for agreeing to be the patient for today. First thing we do is inspection. Have a look at the hands, front and back. We're looking for swelling, we're looking for scars, deformities, uh, muscle wasting, particularly of the athena and hypothena eminences, etc. We then relax the hands on the table and we look at the normal cascade of increasing flexion from the index finger down to the little finger. We then inspect the dorsum of the forearms looking for nodules and any skin lesions. We then examine for the motion, open fingers, close, turn it over, open, close, back this way, open and close. Then we do examination of the wrists, flexion, extension, and ulnar deviation, radial deviation. And then we check for pronation and supination, pronation, supination. And at this stage, what I like to do is get the patient to squeeze my two fingers, and this hand squeeze tight, and then pinch my finger between there and pinch the finger on that side. Terrific. Now we come to the examination of extrinsic function, the extrinsic muscles, and we'll remember that the profundus attaches to the base of the distal phalanx of each finger, and that moves the DIP joint, whereas the superficialis attaches to the middle phalanx and causes flexion at the PIP joint. Now we have to be able to distinguish between the two and the way to do that is to put the MP joint and the IP joint in extension, PIP joint, and then the flexion that occurs at the DIP joint is all due to profundus. And the way to isolate the superficialis tendon is to hold all the fingers in extension and then flex and you can see all the flexions occurring at the PIP joint and you can see that the distal phalanx is floppy. So we test for the profundus, then there, profundus, then there, that one, and for the flex of the thumb. And we test for the superficialis, bend up that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. We then test for extension of the wrist, hold it up, extension of the fingers, making sure the MPs are in full extension, and then extension of the thumb or retroposition of the thumb. We're now going to test for intrinsic function, and we describe three tests for the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. So testing median nerve, we've got abduction against resistance, we've got opposition against resistance, and we also look for wasting of the thena eminence. Testing for the ulnar nerve, open the fingers wide as you can, hold them out, hold them out, testing for abduction, and always test for abduction of the index finger for the first dorsal interosseous. We then test for adduction, hold tight, next one, hold tight, relax, hold tight, relax, and then we then test for adduction of the thumbs, uh, and remember, if your adductor is not working, you get a positive Froman's test. And remember, we've said three tests for the radial nerve, three tests for the median nerve,
three tests for the ulnar nerve. Next, we test for sensation, and we test for the sensation of the tips of each of the fingers, remembering to test for both sides of the ring finger, and we also assess sensation on the dorsum of the hand, and remember that the autonomous zones are median nerve, ulnar nerve, radial nerve. So that's median nerve, ulnar nerve, and radial nerve. Uh, finally, we test for the arterial supply of the hand. Remember, we've got the radial and ulnar arteries. So what is Allen's test and what we do, we block off the arteries, open and close the hand, open, close, leave it open. See how it pales. When you release, you can see how it flushes. Then test for the radial artery, open, close, open, close, leave it open, pale, relax, see how it flushes. I'll just repeat that now without the uh, commentary. So let's have a look at the hand, inspection. Just like that. Okay, now hold the hands like so, close, open, close, open, turn around this way, open, open, close, open. Okay, let's chest for the wrist. This way, and that way, then together, and that way. And then give me the hands this way, there, and there, and give a good squeeze tight, and this one, good squeeze tight, and pinch between my fingers, and pinch on that side. Excellent. Take this hand, now bend that one down, that one down, that one down, that one down, and the thumb. Now bend that one up, that one, that one, that one. The radial nerve, lift up the wrist, hold it up, hold it up, fingers up, hold them up, lift the thumb up to the roof, hold it there, that's great. Now on this hand, lift the thumb up to here, that's great. Put the two together, hold tight, hold tight, relax check for wasting, open the fingers wide, keep them apart, keep them apart, lift this one up against my finger, test for the first dorsal interosseous, and we test for the adductor power, hold tight, relax, tight, relax, tight, relax, hold the paper like that, try and take it away, that's great. Sensation, there, 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 on the dorsum, and then that one, that one, that side, that side, and that side. Now, what I want you to do, open and close the fingers, open, 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 leave it open. Okay, open and close, open, open, leave it open. Terrific. You may have noticed that for each nerve there is a test relating to the thumb. Abduction for the median nerve, adduction for the ulnar nerve, and extension for the radial nerve. So in fact you can test for the motor power of all three nerves using only the thumb. Median nerve, ulnar nerve, radial nerve. Finally then, using the autonomous sensory innovation and movements of the thumb, let me suggest a screening test for the sensory and motor function of all three nerves supplying the hand, which can be carried out in under 15 seconds. Median nerve, ulnar nerve, radial nerve. We've got median nerve, ulnar nerve, and radial nerve. Uh, once again, thank you for your attention. Salani Gashli.